If you guys have ever worked with RBD objects, then you'll know that it's very difficult to get a high degree of detail without the fracturing process taking a very long time. So traditionally, you go through the RBD material fracture node, and specifically if you try to chip objects and get these tiny little details, that typically takes a long time. So what I've developed here is a custom method for getting those very tiny little chipped pieces while at the same time preserving the shape of a glass fractured object. So if you enjoy this quick tip, be sure to check out the rest of the course at cgforge.com. Again, this is a bit more intermediate to advanced and I hope that you enjoy the video. So when it comes to this chipping technique, we have to make the decision between either doing a Boolean or doing a Voronoi fracture. Now I can tell you with the Boolean option that that's going to be much more difficult. Uh, one of the reasons why we're doing this in the first place is because that Booleans will give us bad results. They're likely to error out, they're likely to give us pieces with negative volume, and they're just difficult to control in general. So for these tiny pieces, I don't recommend doing a Boolean. You're just asking for issues with that. Instead, we're going to be doing a Voronoi fracture. And before we get crazy with the for loops and everything else, let me just show you what exactly we're trying to do here. So S for select. Go ahead and select that group up there. Let's say select by the name attribute. And I'm just going to start off by isolating one piece. The reason why I'm doing that is because I want this to work with one piece before I introduce it to all the pieces. So let's say that I have this piece right here and I want to scatter some points for the Voronoi fracture. The question is, how do I maintain the vast majority of this shape without breaking it up evenly? Because if I just did a scatter right here and let's say we had 10 points and we did a Voronoi fracture right there, that's not going to give us a very good looking result. It's going to look like we uh, took this glass and simply just turn it into your typical Voronoi fracture. Instead, it would be nice to concentrate this chipping to either the top or the bottom of the piece. So let's say that I was to just paint where this happens. Let's just see what this visually looks like if we paint a region real quick. So paint an attribute. So we'll say paint a mask right here. And what I'll say is that just at the very top right here, let's say that that's the only place points are allowed to scatter. So right there. In the scatter, we can then say density attribute here is mask. And when we go to fracture, we're maintaining a lot more of this piece than we were before, which is good. Now, if I concentrate that even more towards the top, so let's say that we go here and we reset all the changes. Let's say I just go to the very, very top, just a small little portion up here. That's going to behave even better. So just that tip right there. And when I do an exploded view, this is exactly what I'm looking for. We have a lot more pieces up here, but we've pretty much maintained the overall shape like this. So that's in general what we're trying to achieve here. And the next question is, how can we do this in a procedural way? Because we can't paint every single piece manually like that. So instead, let's try this. Let's say we use the bound SOP right here. And let's say that we have a bound. We'll change this here to sphere. We'll call this accurate bounds right here so that this is the sphere that gets drawn over the piece. And then all we have to do is just change this upper padding a little bit so that it goes down just slightly like that. And then when we go down slightly, these points are going to be now part of an attribute that then get used for the scatter function. So we need to bring down this padding. We need to also think through the fact that every single piece has a different size. 
So every piece is going to need a different amount of padding going down, right? So what if I took a measure stop and I base that value off of the area of each piece. So let's say measure right here and let's measure the area per piece and use name right there. Now that I do that, what I can say is an attribute promotes to a detail for the area. So we go from primitive and we say area to detail. And then once we have that, it'll give us a value, something like that, right? We can then use the detail expression to go up here, grab that detail attribute and use it as a value to place here in this upper padding. So eventually this is going to be in a compiled block. So we'll go to the cog wheel up here, say create spare input, drag over the attribute promote like this, and then we're now allowed to use the detail expression to go pick that up through the purple wire. So negative one, it's called area and zero for the first value that it encounters. As soon as I do that, we now see that this is 0 0.05. And if I set this to a negative value, so I say negative detail right there. If we go to our scene view, that should now give us something like that, which is great. So what's nice again is the fact that this now will work for any piece that we encounter. Just to test this out, let's go find a very different piece real quick. Let's zoom in all the way here to find a really small piece like that. And unfortunately, that's not going to work. Why is that? Well, because when I go here, the sphere gets drawn over this piece, but this piece is kind of wide. So we have all this room up here at the top and it doesn't matter how much you bring down that detail based on the area. The fact is it basically oriented itself based on the width and you're never going to get an accurate amount of room going down. So we want to again isolate the top of this piece. The sphere is not going to do that for us. Let's start thinking outside the box into a different technique. <laughs> Pun intended, because what we're going to do instead is we're going to create a box. We're going to instead use the bound sop right here. And if we use that, we can draw a box around this piece and then we can orient that box like so. And when we orient that box, now all we have to do is find the area or find the face that's furthest away from the center, which let's say is gonna be like right here. And we just find that face, we bring it in a little bit and we isolate the ends of each piece. Forget maybe the Y area, but just find the spot that's furthest away from the center and bring that in a little bit like this. That's going to be a better technique. So what we need to do to figure this out is we need to find a procedural way to isolate these faces. And let's say find the face that's furthest away from the center and bring that in a little bit so that we can isolate the ends. Well, if we create a sort sop right here, what we can do is we can affect the primitive number depending on how far away we are from the center. So if here we say distance from point or proximity to point right there, that will give us the ability to, let's say, extract the centroid here from this bounding box. So I'll say extract centroid, just run over detail so it just looks at the whole piece and we can do the center of mass or we can do the bounding box center. Either way, there's our centroid. We can then say, all right, proximity to point. Which points? This point. So create a spare inputs, drag over that centroid like so, and then we can pick it up using the point expression. So negative one brings us through that wire, point ID zero, look for position, and take the first index for X. Paste, 
one for y and two for z. So now, when we go to the sort, we find the face that's furthest away from the center. And that's always going to be primitive or face number five. Once we have that, we can then just use a peak node and we could say, all right, take face number five or primitive number five. And now we can, let's say, bring this in the negative direction along its normals like that. So for this distance, add another spare inputs. We're going to base this off of the area of the piece. So let's see here, spare inputs, bring over that attribute promotes, go through a detail expression, negative one, we're looking for area, and then take the first value that you find, then you go in the negative direction, and boom. Now we are isolating the endpoints along here. I think it's also a good idea to multiply this whole thing by two to kind of bring it in even more. But now that we have that, it doesn't matter which piece we select. Again, this is all based off of which face is furthest away from the center. So now it's going to give us that bottom piece right there, or let's see if we can find one that would do it on the top. Well, whichever way it is, it's going to isolate those zones by a certain amount. So there you go. And you can also change this distance to be by area. You can say times one if you want, maybe 1.5. You can dial this in however you'd like. But basically now that we have this, let's go ahead and get rid of this bound node right there. We'll then create a group to group the points and then assign an attribute for the scatter. So with this group here, let's call this our scatter points group, group type points, get rid of the base group, say keep in bounding regions and then use a bounding object, which is going to be our bounding box. As soon as we have that, attributes creates, we can then, let's say, create a mask, default value of one, value of zero inside the box. And let's see what that gives us right here. So if I do that, turn off wireframe, and we preview the mask attributes, we should be able to see that this colors things in. Uh, but let's actually go here to the group and say scatter points group. There we go. Okay, so it does that right there, but it also looks like this bounds is so darn close to the object that sometimes these little parts around here get included as well. So what I'll say is this, for the peak, I'll make another version of that, and I'll say group zero through four, and for the distance here, we're gonna go in the positive direction just so that we really make sure that we're only including, let's say, the bottom sections right there. So that'll make sure that we really only hit the areas that we want to hit. And then once we have that, plug it into the scatter, and we've successfully scattered some points in that zone. When we go to do the fracture, for the most part, we kind of keep that shape uh, depending on how much we want to, you know, take this box, we can change that. And last but not least, we need to actually go to this peak, and we cannot do relative references right here with compile blocks. So we actually have to go and specify that more directly. And once we do that, we should now have this guy that we can use a connectivity stop with, set the connectivity to name, promote the name, and then we can do an exploded view. And sure enough, there you go. This is after, and let me show you before. There is before. So before and after. A lot more detail. We mostly keep all of these shapes intact. And by the way, this calculates really, really quickly. If I go here to the scatter and I change this to a value of 10, watch how fast this is. Easy as that, way faster than whatever you have going on in the material fracture node. Uh, so I just want to point that out. 
I'm freezing right now because I'm auto-saving my scene, but <laughs> uh, it's even faster than auto-save, so that'll tell you something there as well. <laughs> uh, but anyway, there you have it, guys. That is a much better way of adding detail to your glass fractures. If you guys are interested in more tips and tricks like this, or you'd like to work your way up to being able to handle custom situations like what you just saw, then visit Destruction 2. You can find all of that at CG Forge. Thanks for watching and have a great day.